Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 17th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what the Trump administration's action on ANWR on Monday of this week means for Alaskans, both the cheerleader and the realist versions. Second, what we are looking for in this week's Alaska election results. And third, where the permanent fund goes from here. A spoiler alert, it's not $5,000 PFDs. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's get cracking here. Of course, the big news is that uh, President Trump has uh, has made a decision and kind of pushed through this idea on Anwar. What does it mean for us, and what does it mean for Alaska? And what's the you know? There's a lot of hype, hype, and rah rah going on, but what does it really mean overall for the uh, for the state of Alaska and uh, and us in general? Well, it's another step. I mean, uh, it it. it the opening of ANWR and the development of ANWR is a multi-step process. Uh, this is one of one of the one of the most important steps was getting the administration and administration to go forward with a leasing decision uh, at uh, at all. Uh, and Senator Murkowski uh, deserves a lot of credit for having uh, moved that step forward when she sort of traded her vote on the tax reform bill in 2017 for the inclusion of a provision uh, in that bill uh, uh, requiring leasing uh, of ANWR by, by certain dates. Uh, that was a key uh, strategic move on her part uh, because that, the 2017 tax bill, was done as a Reconciliation Act, uh, w was put through Congress as part of a Reconciliation Act. Reconciliation Act, Budget Reconciliation Acts only require a majority vote in the Senate, as opposed to uh, as opposed to a filibuster-proof uh, 60 vote, uh, and they got it through barely. Right. Uh, but but they did get it through. So that was that was that was an important step. This this step is is sort of the the next phase in the process. It's the record of decision on uh, on the environmental aspects of how the uh, of how the lease sale would go forward, the the conditions on the lease sale, the terms, the environmental terms uh, on the uh, on the lease sale, and uh, it's been a long time coming since the since the Budget Reconciliation Act was passed, but but we've gotten here, and uh, and the record of decision will be the foundation. Uh, for the for the for the lease that would that would then go forward from that, the the question is the cup. There, there there's there's several, well a lot more steps in the process. <laughs> every every part of the development process, you get a lease, then you want to then you want to drill, and you have to you know, or you want to conduct seismic, or you want to drill, and and then you want to go to development, and then you want to you know build pads and all that. Every step in the process requires its own uh, uh, environmental review, requires its own permits, requirements, its own actions from the administration. So this, this, is, this is an important step in the process, but just one step, step in the process. The next step is the lease sale itself. Uh, and the question, is, the question is when that comes, um, or among other questions is when that comes. Um, and, and the administration has said, uh, they would like to do it by the end of the year. Uh, actually, the, the Secretary of Interior said he would he he hoped to do it by the end of the year. Trump said something different 
uh, yesterday morning. So it's not quite clear what the administration is doing on that front. Uh, but but the next step is, is the lease sale itself. Uh, the cheerleading view of all this is this is this is great news for Alaska. Uh, it means that uh, that we're headed toward development of Anwar, uh, which would mean a lot of uh, a lot of jobs in terms of putting together the uh, the 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 infrastructure to to do the develop to to do the uh, seismic to do the exploration to do the ultimately to do the development uh, potentially a lot of oil that comes out of uh, Anwar which would uh, uh, increase the volume going through taps which would increase uh, uh, production tax payments that wouldn't the state wouldn't wouldn't realize a lot of the royalty it's federal lands um, and and is subject to a condition that 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 governs how the state's portion of that royalty would be spent, uh, but would would generate some revenue for the state in terms of uh, of production tax and uh, and 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 opens up a bright a brighter future going forward. That's certainly the the cheerleading view and certainly you know one view of how this goes. But we're a long way. Uh, the realist view is we're a long way uh, from realizing uh, that potential. Uh, there's a uh, a note this morning in uh, there's a uh, uh, one of the political websites out of DC uh, is called Axios, uh, and there's a long note this morning in Axios Generate, which is the 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 morning uh, uh, email report of uh, of what's going on from from the DC standpoint on energy, um, and it's sort of filled with all of the all of the points at which a Biden administration or indeed a subsequent administration. Uh, could uh, could stop the process. Right. Uh, this process is a little bit different than the normal uh, environmental process because there's a legislative mandate that the leases be sold. Uh, but if the if the Democrats took took uh, uh, back a hold of Congress, took the Senate and the House, uh, that legislative mandate can be changed by subsequent legislation. Right. So there's there's a there's a lot of steps between here. Uh, and the uh, and the end date where we have uh, first oil coming out of coming out of Anwar, uh, at a minimum, we're probably even if everything went perfectly, we're 10 years away from from seeing any benefit of that. But we won't get there if we don't have this initial this this is important step of having the record of decision on uh, on on the leases and uh, and creating the potential for the leases to go forward. Uh, well, like you said, this thing is like an onion. I mean, it's just layer after layer after layer, and any little stoppage in the in the situation can throw a can throw a wrench in it. Give me best case scenario. Uh, you know, what kind of time frame? I mean, if all the ducks aligned and all the planets, you know, came together and everything else, what are we talking about? Uh, you know, to to see first oil start to uh, start to to come out. Oh, it's a it's a long way down the road. So the best case scenario is lease sale uh, in the near future by the end of the year, shortly after the first of the year, somewhere somewhere in the near future. Um, good solid bids uh, from solid companies with the with the with the financial wherewithal uh, to uh, to carry forward on uh, on on this uh, project. Uh, solid bids come in, bids are awarded. No stoppages from the environmental. From the environmental side, in terms of suits or, or attacks on the record of decision, or attacks on the process, um, uh, then uh, whoever would win the bids will want to uh, do seismic out there, getting the permits on seismic, going forward with the seismic program. You know, we, we're constrained in the time period that we can get on the the industry can get on the North Slope, so a couple of years for that. Uh, you, you go forward with the plans for an exploration well. Um, uh, exploration wells, maybe, um, and and getting the permits for those, uh, getting another, going through another environmental round with those, surviving the lawsuits on those, uh, getting an ex getting an exploration well down, uh, finding a, a potential, finding where your potential is, developing a development plan around around that, uh, uh, probably two or three years for the exploration wells, then developing a development plan around that. Going through all of the environmental reviews and and all of the attacks on that. Wait, I already uh, nodded off like ten minutes ago. What? Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, what are we talking about here? A decade? Ten before, years. Ten, ten years. At yeah. least ten years. Yeah. At least ten years. All right. So ten years. All right. So we're 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 a long way, and that is assuming 
that everything falls into place and the and the uh, Democrats don't retain or regain control of one or both houses and and uh, the presidency and everything else. So I mean, it's it's a bad deal. Well, and and assuming Michael that 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 whoever wins these leases is going to have the capital or find the capital to be able to uh, very patient capital uh, to be able to develop these leases. I mean, we, you, we, this is where the, you know, all the bank statements where the banks aren't going to finance Arctic development or aren't going to find develop, aren't going to finance uh, activities in Anwar. That, that's where all this becomes relevant because, right. you know, not only do you have to have somebody willing to do it, you have to have capital backing it up, patient capital, because you're not going to see a, a payout for a heck, heck of a long time, patient capital willing to back it up and uh, and and finance those activities. Yep. All right. Well, we'll be watching that, but we're not going to be cashing that check for a while anyway. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, which leads us on to number two today. Of course, is the primary elections. What uh, we got about three four minutes here. What uh, are we going to start off with? How what are we going to be looking for here? Uh, in today's elections. What are you, Brad Keithley, director, founder of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, going to be looking for in the uh, in today's election? Well, I think there's I think there's certain key uh, uh, primary races uh, that that we're going to be looking for uh, 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 the outcome of those of those races and uh, and how they what signal that sends uh, going forward, certainly in the Senate. Uh, the Geisel uh, Holland uh, primary race uh, in South Anchorage, I think, is going to be key. Uh, Rob Myers' race against John Coghill uh, up in Fairbanks uh, is going to be important. I think if anybody has a chance to pull a Ron Gillum, a successful Ron Gillum, uh, uh, this time around, uh, it's going to be Rob Myers, and uh, and we'll be looking at uh, certainly looking at that race. And then and then there's going to be two clusters of house races. Uh, one is the Valley. Uh, uh, primaries, uh, Lynn Gaddis against uh, Chris Kirka, David Eastman against Jesse Sumner, uh, Mark Newman against Kevin McCabe, and George Rauscher against L.D. Howard. Uh, that cluster of cases, I think, is going to be, imp- or, 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 or uh, primaries is going to be important. I can explain why after the break. And then the second cluster of primaries are, are uh, really those in in South Cent- or uh, in Anchorage and, and the Kenai, the Cop McKay primary certainly Johnston uh, Kaufman um, and the and and the Knopp uh, Gillum. I know that uh, uh, unfortunately uh, uh, Representative Knopp uh, uh, passed, but he's still on the ballot. Uh, people can still vote for him, and um, and and that primary is uh, uh, still important in, in terms of sending a signal about uh, about the way forward. Um, it, so we'll be looking for the outcome from those races. Uh, and I can describe the discuss the outcome I'm looking for uh, after the break. But I think those are going to be the key races that tell us about about where uh, uh, Alaska's fiscal situation is going to is going to is going to head uh, in the next legislature. Absolutely. And of course, we could be waiting for some of those numbers because while the primary is today, declaring winners in some of these races could take more than a week because of the number of absentee ballots. Uh, and everything that's uh, going on. 11% of Republicans request an absentee ballot, 22% of Democrats, and 14% of undeclared voters uh, requested one. And they can wait up to a week for those to uh, go forward. So it ought to be, it may be interesting. The results today may be slightly misleading with most Republicans going in person and then 22% of Democrats and 14% of nonpartisans mailing their votes in. And so we could get some misleading numbers tonight. So don't go uh, popping the corks on all your champagnes tonight because uh, we may not know for more than a week as to what's going uh, what's going on. I think this is going to be, I mean, I, you know, I'm going to be watching Jem tonight for a little bit, but uh, I'll be honest, Brad, I'll probably go to bed early and just wait to see what tomorrow brings because we have no idea what is going to come out of this, especially with the number of absentee ballots that we're talking about floating around out there. We have no way of knowing what, um, you know, what the answer is going to be tonight, uh, or, you know, again, maybe it'll be up to a week from now before we really have a, an idea. Yeah, I think I think any close races, uh, we're not going to be able to call uh, tonight. Nobody's going to be able to call tonight. It's going to, it's going to, we're going to have to go through the entire absentee process. We, we remember uh, uh, last election cycle, Ron Gillum was actually ahead 
uh, at the end of a right. at the end of election night. Right. Uh, and gradually, uh, uh, Machecki uh, uh, pulled back, uh, and then uh, and then took the lead at the end of the absentee uh, ballot counting. So any close races, I think, are uh, are, are we're going to have to wait for the outcome, whether Republican. Uh, or Democrat, because even if uh, even if most of the Republicans are voting in person, and there's a small uh, and there's a relatively small segment of absentees out there, as we saw from the Machecki Gillum case uh, or Machecki Machecki Gillum uh, election, uh, we're gonna have to wait on those to 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 make a final call. Right. No, it's going to be definitely be interesting. Um, we're looking at. Um... Two years ago, 116,000 Alaskans voted in the state primary. Four years ago, 89,000 voted in the primary. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how many, you know, how much COVID is affecting it. Are, are people more engaged because of monies, because of uh, they're paying attention now for the first time because they didn't have anything else to do? What's your What's your feeling on this so far? Do you think we're going to be more in line with t- two years ago or four years ago? Boy, Michael, that's just that's just hard to hard to tell. I think there's a lot of, I mean, there's certainly a lot of heat being generated out in the valley, for example, uh, in terms of the mailers, in terms of the ads, in terms of the signs, in terms of candidate appearances, and in terms of the the dichotomy uh, that's emerged out there. And I and I think that sh- that is likely to generate a lot of uh, a lot of activity. Um, uh, y- y- in the in the McKay uh, uh, cop race again, there's been a lot of mailers, there's been a lot of signs, there's been a lot of of uh, campaign activity by the candidates, uh, and so that should generate a, a lot of activity. Uh, Myers Coghill is 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 tough for me to call. I, I think I guess I think it is a sort of breaks down on a on a district by district basis. Is there enough? Has there been enough smoke fire? engagement in a district to 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 generate uh generate turnout in those districts i think the turnout looks more like uh two years ago uh certainly in those districts where there's not that sort of activity in my district for example uh uh, the lake otis tudor uh, district there's virtually no activity there's virtually no primary so i voted this morning by fax but uh but uh, I, I'm not sure there's going to be a huge turnout in my district. Yeah, no, I'm I'm watching this, and and I guess it just ma- it, what I think what matters is how were people personally affected. I think in districts where they lost the PFD, where they saw that, they will probably be more motivated, especially if it's a larger component of their income, uh, to get out there and do it. And then some districts like. Uh, you know the the uh, uh, Cog Hills district up in uh, in the North Pole Fairbanks area, where people are feel, feeling, I think, more frustrated. More, uh, I think there's some betrayal being felt up there. I think that motivate my might motivate some people. And like you said, it could be that Rob Myers is the uh, kind of the Ron Gillum moment. Either you know Cog Hill gets a come to Jesus meeting uh, from all that, or. Maybe Meyer takes it or pushes the envelope hard enough that that something else changes. I don't know yet, but uh, I I think that uh, I think he's definitely been feeling the heat up there, uh, and and everybody that I've talked uh, spoken to anecdotally anyway has said that they are frustrated and they're out there getting you know getting the word out for people like uh, Rob Meyer. So hopefully something you know hopefully something changes. That's I guess my whole thing. Yeah, some people are calling that race uh, based upon campaign funds. Um, uh, I, I noticed Jeff Landfield came out with a column where he was, you know, predicting the outcome of various races, and he he gave that race to Coghill based upon dollars. I yeah, I think Ron Gillum showed us uh, that dollars really aren't aren't in, that important in a district where you can generate a lot of, as you say, frustration with the uh, or where there is a lot of frustration with the with the incumbent. Uh, I think that uh, emotion, if you will, or that uh, level of, of 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 you know, it, uh, uh, I guess emotion uh, that that gets generated in a race race like that. Um, I think that can I think that can drive a lot of activity. So I'm not I'm not putting as much money on on the dollars in that uh, in that race as I am on uh, what you just mentioned the the frustration with Coghill. Brad kind of just broke down some of the races. Before we went to break, and now he's going to dive a little bit deeper into that. Uh, Brad, what uh, what say you? What uh, what is your thing here? 
Well, there's really there's really two categories that I've got here, Michael. One is uh, the first category is uh, is there frustration with uh, with the incumbents, uh, and is that going to result in challengers who I believe are more fiscally conservative uh, uh, succeeding in in overtaking those incumbents? And in that pot, I put Coghill, Myers, uh, Geisel, Holland. Uh, and then the and then the Anchorage House races or the Anchorage and Kenai House races, Cop McKay, Johnson Kaufman, and and Not Gillen. I, I think you know if 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 several of those races, if the incumbents are defeated in several of those races, uh, the challengers uh, uh, succeed. I think that's an indication that uh, the Alaskans, at least in those districts, are frustrated with the direction that the incumbents have been taking us in terms of deep PFD cuts using PFD taxes. Uh, to fund government, uh, uh, not really cutting uh, the level of uh, of government uh, significantly, um, and I think I think that will indicate a a more conservative, uh, a more fiscally conservative uh, uh, legislature going forward. So, I'm hopeful that uh, that at least in several of these races, uh, uh, the incumbents are defeated, uh, and the challengers uh, succeed. That's that's one pot. Uh, and I think that's sort of a, a broad indicator of uh, of the level of frustration uh, will be a broad indicator of the level of frustration with by Alaskans or satisfaction in the case the if the, if the incumbents prevail, satisfactions with the the direction that the state's going. The second category is 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 going to be more controversial on this program, um, uh, but it's the house races in the valley, um, the the Gaddis, Kirka, Eastman, Sumner, Newman, McCabe. And Rousher Howard uh, races. Um, I <laughs> I am I am concerned uh, about the about the outcome of those races. I think for for us to have a successful outcome in the next legislature, we need uh, 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 a legislature which is conservative, fiscally conservative oriented, looking for cuts, uh, looking for. Um, uh, Ways to uh, reduce the pressure on PFD cuts, uh, stabilize the PFD, uh, maintain the PFD, restore the PFD. Um, we need a we need a fiscally conservative legislature to do that. But I am concerned we can swing too far, um, and and if we elect um, uh, conservatives uh, who sort of follow the David Eastman approach, uh, who are um, some would say extreme conservatives. Um, I think we put in danger uh, uh, creating a, a situation in which uh, we'll, ha we'll have another uh, 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 bipartisan uh, house where you know, we will have an, uh, an extreme conservative segment who will uh, say, you know, we're going to we're going to. We're going to hold out. We're going to hold our hold our breath until government's cut, you know, by 2.3 billion dollars uh, before we agree to uh, to, uh, to anything. Uh, we're going to balance the budget by spending cuts, uh, and and we're not going to you know take another step forward without doing that. Um, and and I'm afraid we will have us if if we have a segment that does that. Uh, even the even moderate fiscal conservative even, even even fiscal conservatives that might get elected uh, this election cycle like McKay and and Kaufman and Gillum might end up uh, being sort of pushed over into uh, a bi a bipartisan uh, house uh, because there's you, you can't you can't form uh, a, a successful caucus you can't form a successful plan uh, with that sort of extreme fiscal conservatism setting out to the right. Um, so I think I think those races will sort of indicate what kind of house uh, we're going to be headed for. I, I, Lynn Gaddis, uh, 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 George Rauscher, uh, that every candidate has their faults, but I think those candidates have have stood to the, the test of time about being able to sort of uh, uh, put a path forward. Uh, that can finally get us to some sort of fiscal certainty and some sort of fiscal sanity uh, in the state. Get us a a, a fiscally sustainable uh, plan forward that you know doesn't jerk from one side to the other uh, in any given year and doesn't and doesn't depend on you know doesn't continue spending at the levels uh, at the levels we've had. So I think I think there's a path forward um, uh, with with fiscal. Uh, uh, 
fiscal conservatives that can put together a successful plan and succeed uh, in getting us on a f fiscally sustainable path. Um, I'm concerned that that gets derailed uh, if we have a, a segment that uh, is is so far to the right that uh, they're going to hold their breath uh, until uh, until certain things that are that are not going to be realistically achieved. Uh, are, um, are 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 somehow accomplished and you're speaking specifically towards like uh cutting you know cutting the budget versus uh you know f some other uh, possibility of new revenue or things like that i mean wouldn't a fiscally conservative coalition uh in the uh in the valley be enough to think to push back on some of this and get some of these you know and get some of these expenditures down i mean uh, even uh, you know, e even if it was uh, you know two thirds of the of the uh, uh, election uh, of the elected officials there, wouldn't it be enough to hold true? Or is this more of the, uh, in your mind, kind of the David Eastman standing in the way of any kind of formation of a of a plan or a caucus? Yeah, my concern is that if if we have a segment, uh, and this is Eastman Kirka. Um, uh, and L.D. Howard primarily, if we have a segment that just says we're going to hold our breath until we until we cut government uh, uh, down to down to revenues, uh, that that's just going to that's that's not going to be accomplished. That's not realistic. It's not accomplishable. I understand how you go down to Juno and say that. I understand how you go down to Juno and vote for that. But that's not going to put together a budget. Uh, and and I and, and and my concern is if we have that segment sitting um, uh, in the in the Republican uh, majority, that that we won't accomplish anything, that that there won't be enough votes to uh, to deliver a budget, and 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 we'll have the same thing that happened last legislature, which is you know, a segment of the Republicans will hold their breath and go over and join uh, the Democrats in a bipartisan caucus, uh, caucus to put together a, a realistic budget. Lynn, Gatt I think Lynn Gaddis. Um, uh, and and George Rauscher and Jesse Sumner will put together a fiscally conservative budget. I think they will. I think they will make deep spending cuts. Uh, I think they will. I think they will push uh, to preserve uh, the PFD uh, or or to make a sustain to create a sustainable PFD. Uh, but it's going to be. I mean, it, it's 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 going to be a, a, a task, and it's going to be a task that that takes some realism to accomplish. So. Um, I, I'm, it, it's, it's, it's how the numbers break out, um, uh, in terms of, 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 of whether there are enough, uh, moderate, uh, not moderate, but there are enough fiscally conservative, uh, Republicans that are realistic in terms of their expectations and realistic in terms of what they can accomplish, uh, together. Um, I think that the, there has to be enough numbers for that to uh, to succeed. I that's I mean, and Jennifer Johnston isn't part of that. Jennifer Johnston is part of the cut the PFD to zero. Uh, Chuck Kopp is part of the cut the PFD to zero. We need we need to eliminate that element uh, from the from the Republican uh, majority as well, uh, because that element will side with the with the uh, with the Democrats and uh, and continue to push. Uh, uh, PFD cuts in, in lieu of in, in lieu of other uh, spending cuts or other other sorts of uh, more equitable revenue approaches. So you, you you we can swing too far left if we maintain Johnston and we maintain COP. That's swinging too far left, uh, and the and the PFD and fiscal stability is in peril from that. Just like we can swing too far left, we can swing too far right, uh, and uh, and and put in peril uh, achieving a realistic uh, outcome. Uh, if we uh, if we go too far right, so it's sort of yep. we got to we got to find a way to sort of thread the needle and uh, and and push through a realistic achievable uh, budget. Have the numbers to be able to do that fiscally conservative, realistic, achievable budget, uh, as opposed to swinging too far to the left or frankly too far to the right. I think a lot of people are frustrated with. Um you know, kind of the go along to get along, the Lynn Gaddises of the world and others. Now, Lynn has done some good things, and she definitely was the was one of the prime mo movers in uh, maintaining and protecting the PFD. But people are feeling like if we keep sending the same politicians back, you know, that voted for some of these budgets, it's a it's a problem. What say you? Well, Lynn is definitely not a go along to get along. I mean, we went through the the 2016 PFD vote uh, in the in the last. Uh, 
uh, in the last segment or the last last week, and uh, and she's definitely not a go along to get along uh, a person, but she she is realistic, and 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 she is realistic about the fact that we're facing a 2.3 billion dollar deficit, 50 percent of the budget's in deficit. She will find savings. She's 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 you know, she she was on House Finance before. She will find savings. But she will find achievable savings. If we if we have if we have a people who are saying I'm going to hold my breath until I get 2.3 billion dollars uh, in cuts, and that's essentially what I've heard out of Kirka and Eastman and others. If I'm going to if I, if we're going to hold our breath, if I have people who are going to hold their breath until uh, until uh, uh, they get 2.3 billion dollars in cuts, they're they're going to pass out. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to have 2.3 billion dollars in cuts. Not even the governor is going to push. An agenda of 2.3 billion dollars in cuts. We've got to find a way that cuts what we that that cuts a lot, uh, but also is realistic about limits on what could be cut, uh, and 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 deals with uh, how we're going to pay for uh, for the remainder of it. Uh, we've got to find people who are practical. We're out of savings. The time that uh, the time that people can be you know pontificating and 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 preening and standing on the floor uh, and you know holding their breath it is gone. We're out of savings. We've got to have we got to have realists who deal with that uh, and, uh, and 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 put the legislature and put the state uh, on a sustainable sustainable path going forward. So, you know, I, I I think I think going too far, just like going too far to the left with uh, with Johnson and 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 Cop, going too far to the left is bad. Uh, and ends us and ends up in a situation where we just use PFD cuts to to fund government. I think going too far to the right uh, is bad as well, and puts us in a situation where we don't have a resolution uh, of our budget situation, uh, where we just have people standing off to the side, holding their breath, uh, and not achieving uh, not achieving a resolution uh, of this issue. Um, I, I the governor wants to the governor wants to achieve something. Uh, in these last two years, you need people in the legislature who is going to who are going to work with him to achieve uh, outcomes. I think that, that this assumes that uh, that some of the other uh, uh, folks, the conservative folks, are kind of ideologues in the stripe of Eastman, in that they will not budge in any way, shape, or form for anything that's not exactly what they want. Uh, I don't take that from people like L.D. Howard. Uh, Kirk, I don't really have a good feel for, but L.D. Howard, I'm not feeling that way about. And, um, you know, I've been suspect of kind of of how, you know, Rauscher and some of these other guys have, um, you know, kind of played the system overall, I think, in the in the in the long game. But um, so, you know, I just I don't know. I, I I agree that, you know, some of the frustration out of this is because some of the intractability of people like Eastman, who's not willing to come to the table and do this. Some people see that as a sign of strength to say, oh, he's just 100 percent conservative and that's what it is. But I see it more as a, uh, uh, you know, almost a martyrdom complex in some ways to say, look, look at what I've done. I've sacrificed myself on this hill and not really, again, moving the moving the needle forward. I don't necessarily see that out of all the candidates that you've lined out there. Well, the, 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 let's take Kirk as an example. Uh, I've had an exchange with Kirk on, on this issue, and 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 basically was you know it's my usual question how do you how do you get 2.3 billion if you if you don't if you don't have all the cuts how do you get 2.3 billion well and Kirk and Kirk's response I mean what's your plan B and Kirk's response to that was well we'll sell land we, <laughs> we you know we only have so much land in this state and it only brings so much an acre there's and and. And I did some calculations like we had to sell it for two hundred dollars an acre uh, and sell over a million acres uh, in order to uh, well yeah that'd be it to 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 fund the budget deficit this year uh, and then we'd have to keep doing that uh, every year from here on out that's not a realistic solution um, and 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 LD Howard is sort of the same I mean what's what's the plan B and and you don't hear a plan B you hear a you hear a we're going to cut it we're going to cut our way out of this well we're not. Uh, the realistic, the realism is we're not, uh, and and you don't really hear a solid plan B that deals with the 2.3 billion dollar deficit, and and the problem with that is if you don't have a solid plan that deals with the 2.3 billion dollar deficit, 
um, you don't have a budget. And, 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 and then the people who are in the middle, uh, the Tiltons and others, are going to say, we got to have a budget. And, and you sort of force them into an alliance with the Democrats who are going to insist on, who have in the past insisted on PFD cuts as a way of doing it. So it's just, it's, it's the conservative, just like, just like you can go too far to the left with Johnston and, 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 and Kopp and Knopp uh, and others, you can go for, too far to the right. Uh, and, and we need people who are knowledgeable about how to cut, who are committed to cutting, but who are realistic about it as well. Uh, give me the thumbnail headline here for number three, which we're not going to get to, where the permanent fund goes from here. Give me the 30-second version of your of your bullet point here. I've heard some people talk about the concern with the permanent fund and maintaining the permanent fund dividend is that the that the dividend may go to $5,000, and we certainly don't want – we and some people say we don't want to do that. Uh, that's not realistic. I mean, part of the reason the permanent fund has, has, has grown over the past several years – is we've put in, we've put the other 50 percent, the 50 percent that otherwise was supposed to go to government government under Hammond's uh, vision, or otherwise could go to government under Hammond's vision. That's gone into the in the permanent fund corpus or into the earnings reserve and has been part of the investment base. We're we're jerking that we're we're taking that out now. So the permanent fund is not going to grow as much as it has in the past, and we're not we're not headed toward a five thousand dollar dividend. All right. Well, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him at ak4sb.com. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. And uh, Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top Three.